Good evening. This is Professor Rush again, uh, this time talking about ancient aliens, uh, gene splicing, and the composite deities in uh, ancient Egypt. The ancient Egyptians had a plethora of gods, goddesses, and demons which come and go in importance over the course of nearly 3,000 years. Most of the gods, depending on the context, take on different names. For example, the cow goddess Hathor, a motherly, sensual persona, is also the lioness Sekhmet, who attempts to devour humanity after Ra informs Hathor that humans are going to begin worshipping Amun in favor of Ra. In a way, the composite nature of Hathor Sekhmet uh, is similar to Inanna, Astarte, and Astareth, different names for the goddess of sex and war, in the Sumerian, Babylonian, and Akkadian traditions in the Middle East. Now, before I get started with the composite Egyptian deities, let me explain the nature of the Egyptian spiritual tradition as practiced or experienced by the ancient Egyptian people. Uh, these people were animists, uh, that is to say they attributed power to all aspects of the world around them. The trees, water, mountains, and certainly serpents, crocodiles, uh, hippopotamus, uh, lions, jackals, and, and so on. In a sense, they did not see themselves uh, separate from the world, uh, and that world directly affected them. They invented magical practices, just as did the Catholic Church and other fascist political traditions that pass as uh, religion today, as a means of controlling people and certainly controlling the powers of nature to maintain life and ability to produce life, as well as safe passage uh, through the underworld. Now, these innumerable deities worshipped by the ancient Egyptians were local or personal gods and goddesses. Uh, inanimate objects uh, were in a deity resided. Uh, these would be called fetishes by anthropologists. The Sphinx would be uh, a good example whereby carving an image of a lion, probably the original image, and then the pharaoh's head was added, you release the entity in the rock. There are also birds, crocodiles, and so on, often associated with specific geographies uh, of the area. Then there are the cosmic deities, for example, Ra, the sun god, Nut, the sky goddess, or Amun, the hidden one, uh, often connected to state worship and their magical practices, as the cosmic gods are a mirror of the politic that stands below it. As an aside, the uh, god Amun is referenced after Christian prayer as Amen. We see this same cosmic and on-the-ground representation in, for example, Judaism, where there is a cosmic god, Yahweh, in reality a jealous demon bent on enslaving humankind. Just read Deuteronomy and get the flavor of this. And beneath him is the king who uh, enforces the demon's will. We see the same thing in Catholicism, although the popes and cardinals uh, have this demon confused with Jesus, who is anything but a demon. Returning to Egypt, uh, these people worshipped the sun, the moon, the stars, and created stories and myths to explain that which they did not understand. Just as the ancient alien hunters uh, created their own story uh, surrounding that which obviously they do not understand. Now let me explain animism in more detail. Animism, in essence, is a form of projection, of projecting self and one's likes, dislikes, hopes, and fears into the world. This is, in all probability, an anachronism left over from their hunting and gathering days when they didn't see a difference between themselves and the animals that they hunted. Uh, this close identity can be seen in the cave paintings uh, in, in France. For example, at the Cave of the Three Brothers in southern France, we encounter a shaman in a composite animal suit, suggesting this strong identity with the animals they were hunting and eating. Through identity and proper ritual, of course, most likely accompanied by the ingestion of mind-altering substances, they would travel to the other side and convince the animals to come back for another meal. Of course, the animals were the meal. In this image, we can see several motifs that are still in play today. Note the genitals of a cat or feline representing life, and also a sun symbol. To the right of the genitals is the tail of a wolf, a predator who takes life 
thus representing death. Note the antlers of a red deer which fall off and regenerate, representing life, death, and return, and associated with the moon, for the moon also sheds its shadow and returns. Then there is the face, probably representing an owl, a night predator, and most likely connected to the underworld. So the shaman, through identity and ritual enactment, displays the reality of death, but is promoting life. Thus we see the symbols of life, death, and return, the major components in, for example, Christianity today. This slide from the Mushroom and Christian Art illustrates the same identity uh, with nature, a botanical identity in this case, in the garb of the popes who wear clothing representing the Anamita muscaria mushroom. There can be little doubt about this. There is also the mitre, another nature symbol worn by Pope John Paul II on the right in this case, which is symbolic of the fish that swallowed the penis of Osiris after he was torn to pieces by his evil brother Seth, and his penis was thrown into the Nile and consumed by a fish. This is likewise the basis for the fish meal on Friday observed in the Catholic tradition. This is symbolic of the consumption of the sacred flesh. The fish meal on Friday, by the way, a ritual forced upon Catholics, was moderated by the Catholic Church in recent times once the reason for the meal entered public knowledge, most likely through the writings of Joseph Campbell. The Catholic Church denies this, but they have pretty much lied about everything connected to their tradition. Now back to ancient Egypt. Now I cannot review all of the Egyptian composite deities because of time limitations, but let me introduce you to some of them. These deities are not the product of gene splicing and experimentation, which is absurd by any standard, but instead the product of creative minds attempting to take control of their world, their destiny. In this slide we see Anubis, the god of embalming, who accompanies the deceased to the scales of judgment, as mentioned in the previous presentation. Anubis is the son of an illicit relationship between Seth's wife, Nephthys, when she snuck into Osiris' bedroom and seduced him. We are told Osiris thought it was Isis, but in the real world you and I wouldn't make that mistake. So this is a literary device to bring forth a new player in the myth and create conflict between Osiris and Seth. You don't have much of a story without jeopardy, without conflict. The child born to Osiris and Nephthys was Anubis, the jackal-headed boy. The connection between Anubis embalming and the jackal is that jackals can consume and digest rotten flesh, unlike dogs or lions. Consuming the dead, in a sense, is a form of embalming, as the flesh becomes the life force of the individual who consumes it. Said another way, it resurrects in the one who consumes it. So, remember the next time you eat a steak, that you are helping the animal to resurrect. According to the ancient alien hunters, Anubis represents gene splicing between humans and jackals, and therefore uh, these must represent real images of composite beings, again a confusion of the symbol with its reference. This slide is from the Book of the Dead of a noble woman whose name translates into the moon is her strength and is from the 26th dynasty or somewhere around 600 BCE. The Book of the Dead, by the way, is not a black book with lock and hinges as portrayed in the Mummy movie with Brandon Fraser and Rachel Weisz. It is a papyrus scroll and there are many of these still in existence. Uh, refer to the Twelve Gates uh, to understand the difference between the Pyramid Text, the Coffin Text, and the Book of the Dead. Here we see Osiris, the judge of the dead in the underworld, in front of whom are offerings. Next is Amut, the composite monster, who will eat your heart if it weighs more than the feather. Have you ever heard the expression, eat your heart out? Well, that's where this comes from. Next is Toth, the Ebus-headed god of knowledge, writing, and also a messenger of the gods. Toth was an important deity in the Old Kingdom and mentioned frequently in the pyramid text where Ra, the sun god, is said to travel on the wings of Toth as he traverses the heaven during the day in his sun bark bringing light to the world. 
Toth also protects and serves Osiris, the judge of the dead in the underworld. Toth was said in one of the mythic renderings to have healed the eye of Horus, which, during the contendings of Seth and Horus, Seth, after turning himself into a pig or boar, tore out Horus's eye. Seth lost a testicle in the battle. The Egyptian gods called the pig an abomination after this event, which led to the Jews uh, to abstain from eating pig meat when they assembled their composite mythology as presented in the Old Testament. Now, if you think the Old Testament is a factual representation of the history of the Jews, you are as gullible as those who believe the ancient alien story. Another manifestation of Toth is the baboon, seen on the far right, who represents primal knowledge, for even the baboon, a terrestrial monkey, praises the sun god Ra as he emerges from the eastern horizon each morning. In this next slide on the far right is Horus, the hawk-headed god. In the Osiris round, Horus is the son of Isis and Osiris. Isis was impregnated by the dead Osiris after he was murdered by his evil brother Seth. After Osiris was lured into a coffin that exactly fit him during a grand party, 72 attendants came in and placed the lid on, firmly secured it, and threw it in the Nile. Osiris drowned, but the coffin drifted to the Mediterranean and finally was beached uh, in Lebanon, where the roots of a Lebanese cedar tree surrounded his coffin. Those of you familiar with the story can perhaps see the connection to the Anamita muscaria mushroom that grows synergistically on the roots of conifer trees. The tree was cut down and fashioned into a pillar for the palace of a local prince. Isis finally located the pillar, extracted the coffin, removed the lid, and lay closely upon the dead Osiris and conceived Horus. This was a virgin birth and is more than likely connected to Jesus in the Christian tradition. Horus is known as the god of light. For a complete rendition of the Osiris round, see the Twelve Gates. In this slide we see Seth, the evil brother of Osiris, who is depicted in a rather strange manner. I'm not sure his animal reference has been definitely identified, and perhaps that's the point. He represents evil and the desert land, a wild, unpredictable place full of danger. An interesting point comes through in what is called the Was Scepter, as held by Anubis on the far right. The Was Scepter is a determinative for Seth and is held in various images by all the other deities, but never uh, by Seth himself. To me, this indicates balance, or the balance of good and evil. The ancient Egyptians realized that, unlike the later traditions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, you cannot eliminate evil. Instead, it has to be kept close. You have to keep an eye on it, at least it gain control. It's like politicians in this country. You have to keep them close and keep an eye on them, at least they use extortion and bribery to pass laws that are unconstitutional and set dangerous precedents. If you don't understand my reference, uh, take a close look at the history of how Obama passed his Obamacare legislation. I'll have more to say about politicians and Obama and his dirty dozen in a future YouTube presentation. In this final slide we see Kanum, a very important deity associated with the Nile and the creation of life. He creates, in this case, humans out of clay on a potter's wheel. Perhaps you can appreciate the connection to the Judaic Christian God who also creates man from clay. So, uh, with this presentation, are we dealing with creative minds of the ancient Egyptians who strongly identified with nature and fashioned their gods accordingly for psychological protection? Or are these composite gods the product of aliens engaging in experimental gene splicing? In my mind, the Sitchin and ancient alien hunters have confused symbols with their references to create an absurd story to fit gullible minds. Now, in the next presentation, I will discuss the psychology of gullibility and why people believe in such absurd positions as ancient aliens and much of the nonsense and half-truths presented by academics, the mass media, and certainly politicians in this country.